Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you very much for joining once again on the Monks Podcast. And As always, it's an honor. <laughs> many devotees, they told, they wrote back to me personally and said that, you know, they never thought that, especially those who had read contemporary literature, they said that a discussion like this, they thought they wouldn't have thought possible maybe a decade ago. That normally we had this idea that everything mundane is to be dismissed. So I, I feel that it opened a lot of horizons, not just for me, but for quite a few readers. Ah, so it's amazing. <laughs> Maharaj. So today, Maharaj, I thought we could discuss about, um, about Carl Jung. Since you also mentioned that Prabhupada said he seems to be the most sensible among uh, the Western philosophers. So I thought of broadly taking this in three parts. Uh, you can, of course, uh, suggest an alternative framework. One is that um, we can took, uh, look at Carl Jung's uh, uh, role in Western intellectual history broadly, where he was coming from. And then, then we better understand his ideas. And then second is then we can look at where his ideas inter interact with, uh, uh, how they interact with, with Bhakti wisdom or Vedic wisdom. And then we could talk about how it relates with us in today's world. Where oh. as, as devotees, when you're practicing or sharing, we could, uh, we could go it that way. I mean, we could go from the third to the first also, the other. <laughs> <laughs> that is a broad framework, I thought. Let's see what we got here. I got the... <laughs> yeah, okay. It's my nose. So it, so it sounds very nice. It's it's a nice way to approach it, um, because uh, you know where did Jung come from? Um, this is this is very nice because you, you're coming, you know, in some ways from this um, you know Asian perspective of life. You have that heritage, you know. Yes. And yes. we're trying to we're, we're considering the possibility of building bridges here, you know between cultures to get benefits. Um, but at the same time too, I think you probably were, were, were raised up in, in, in the industrialized society, right? Yes. Your education, true. everything. And so that's coming, was generated out of England and, you know, and places like that, you know, so we have it. So Jung's perspective is not like, it's just basically in some ways our perspective. So what's coming to me is that if um, many people like yourselves to find your own heritage, Jung then becomes a tool, you know, by, by which you know, industrialized uh, Asians can, can find their own heritage, which was what Prabhupada was also trying to do too. Yeah. By finding your own heritage, you are talking about uh, the archetypes or I mean, how, how would Jung help us to find, are you talking psychologically speaking or because historically speaking or how? That's a remarkable way of looking at it. Uh, I yes. think one very, very nice place to start with here. Uh, let me let me do, show this. You see, you see here we have a uh, uh, Philemon Foundation, uh, Shonu Shamdashini. Okay, and uh, he's professor. He was he, he's at the University of London, you know, University College London, and uh, he was uh, in the in the history of medicine, with focusing on Jung, but now he's a uh, professor in the School of European Languages, Culture and Society, you know, which of course includes Carl Jung in, in the German. You know? And also now he's Vice Dean of Arts and Humanities in the faculty. So he's had his own very, very extensive development in his own like uh, career and trying to promote these things and help help culture like that. Uh, I, I think he's from Cindy, uh, Cindy background. They have again, cultural background, you know? Um, so, uh, the reading list you see here too. You see the books I have on top there from, from Carl Jung. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Yeah, uh, I asked many times Jungian followers. You see Carl Jung sitting there, and I asked them. I say, if, if Carl Jung was Carl Jung was alive, alive tonight now, would he still be smoking a pipe? And all, invariably they all kind of stop and smile for a second and then shake their head. No, probably not. <laughs> he would have wouldn't be smoking anymore. You know. But that was a long time ago, the cultural ambience. So there's the, what are called the Tavistock Lectures, which are a series of lectures he gave at the Tavistock Foundation in London. And it's still there. It's a very powerful intellectual organization organizing these like, you know, conferences and things like that. 
then there is the, the Kundalini uh, Yoga uh, book, which is a, a se se seminar that Jung did with another another philosopher, which is again very good because you can, you know, we can match up the Kundalini de development. Then uh, the autobiography, uh, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, which was done with one of his uh, lady uh, students, and then especially we have Carl Jung and the Making of Modern Psychology. The dream of a science, and that is like Rupa Go, uh, Jiva Goswami's Anuchedas. I mean, what do you call it? Um, uh, Sandarbhas. Oh, okay. That's, you know, Shoshonu Shandashini did that, and it took me like two or three months to read it. You know, and it's it's written like that. I think in Anuchedas, it's like little like you know, one page, two three page essays on different topics, which are put together in roughly a chronological order about Jung's life and how he developed and stuff like that and people he was encountering. And it's a very nice way to look at it. And then finally, the one I read the most recently was uh, Jung in India, which was I was directed to that by um, Bernardo Nantes, who is the, uh, the translator of Jung's Red Book into Spanish and has his own very powerful institute you know, like that. So the one, Carl Jung and the Making of Modern Psychology the dream of a science is very much, you know, and and again, these are for people who have, have a passion for these things, like myself, and who have a scholarly scholarly intention. And uh, now I see I can talk about these things at any, any level, you know, university level, um, professors, anybody. And Shonu um he he did the the, the Philemon Foundation, he translated the Red Book, and so on. So he he's a ni nice example. Of, uh, of someone coming out of this Indian, you know, uh, cultural heritage, and and trying to uh, what's the thing, um, you know, to trying to co connect with his, um, what do you say, with his own, own heritage, you know, of, of of thought, perspective, attitude, and you're asking them, what does it mean co co historically, culturally, everything else. That's why I think we have to get into this point of who are we and, and how much we're baggage we're bringing with us and how deep it is and so on. So, so right away we get into this point of who am I and, and do I really inherit things from a certain family, you know? And, 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 and do I take them in my mother's womb? Do I take them with my mother's milk? Do I take them with my first day in school? You know? Yeah. And, and how, how much do these form allow me to understand things or not understand them, you know? Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So, so what you're saying is that in some ways, our subtle body, our subtle body is formed by the culture and the society in which we grow up. And that shapes both our, the way we look at the world and even the way we look at Krishna consciousness. So no, that's, that's part of what I was saying. Yeah. Okay. The other part is we come into this life and the Jung's exact term is, uh, uh, how does it go? Rasga, it's interesting, something, ta tabula rasga. Yeah, yeah I heard of tabula rasga, yeah. Okay, yeah. Ras rasgar means to scratch. <laughs> like that. And tabula means we don't come into this world as a blank, blank slate. Yeah, we don't come into this world as a blank slate. Yeah. And so this is, um, let me show you this one more slide here. Two, th two things that are very central here. One is this one here. Okay. So th this, because these, these, these are slideshows we've been doing all over the world. Can you see it now? Yes, yes. Okay. So this was the book, Dialectical Spiritualism, A Vedic View of Western Philosophy. And as I understand the history, Prophet asked for Shamasun Dardas and, uh, and the Hayagriva Das, Professor Howard, Howard Wheeler, I guess his name was, to, to do this, to ask him questions and telling, to describe to him Western philosophers, you know, and then he would give them his comments. So you see the list here that went from Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, St. Thomas Aquinas, Descartes, Leibniz, John Locke, Darwin, Henry Bergson, Sartre, Freud. And then um, Howard Wheeler, uh, I guess I agree with said, that ends our session with Jung. He's the last one. And Srila Prabhupada said, so far, he seems to be the most sensible. <laughs> oh. So, 
So very, uh, what very, you know, distinct analysis of, of, of Jung's perspective from, this, from the Bhakti Vedanta, you know, uh, purport. Yeah. Yes, Maharaj. So that, I think, is, that's, in many ways, that's why I, I took some interest in it, because it's such a declaration, you know, and so on. So Maharaj, in that, again, again yes. yeah. it's the same thing that we say, Prabhupada says, our Siddhanta, that you don't come into this world as uh, tabula rasga. You bring a lot of karma with you. And, and, and maybe you're taking birth in a certain nation because, mm. you know, that, that, that's what you're, you're destined to do. And that's how you understand things and so on. Yeah. Oh, okay. So two questions. Mm, this is, okay. the first is that when um, Prabhupada had these discussions, there are some devotee scholars who have expressed some concerns about this, that the philosophers themselves were not represented properly because the devotees were presenting those philosophers were not well versed in those philosophies. So, so how? I mean, you could say that these discussions are starting materials for the way we can engage with these philosophers. We can't say necessarily that these are like conclusive deliberations. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I think that I, I think both the people who did it would say the same thing. They just read a book and they have some background, and, and it's not completely wrong. Of course, but yeah. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Okay, but still, based on whatever Prabhupada was presented about those philosophers, he considered Young to be the most sensible, which is a significant yes. thing. I, I think he liked he liked uh, Socrates. He said he was yeah. a good boy. Uh, he just didn't have a guru. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. And. When he said that, when you talk about the tabula rasa, is he had, had did Carl Jung have any idea of reincarnation, or how Ooh, did? He... Okay. Yeah. See, in my development in this process, uh, we're trying to find somebody on the other side of the bridge. <laughs> okay. Because yeah. I have some development here in this idea, and you have some development, you know. But we're yelling across the river, and we're trying to uh, Professor Ravi Gupta. And myself, yeah. Radhika Raman, we're trying to uh, get a hold and have a conversation together with uh, Shona Shambhashini. Of course, he's a very busy man, everything else, and we've had some contact with just a little bit. And we're trying to find somebody from his side who has this interest, you know, that that uh, we have in the project and, and who, can, who knows Jung. Because uh, Jung's ideas, I think, were changing from the time you started to the time you finished. My general perspective, you know, and again, you see what I researched and everything else, uh, was that he was caught in the same kind of ambience that everybody else was at that time, that the self is a product of the body, you know, to some degree, to some degree, to some degree, I'm saying, to some degree, okay. you know, and a lot less than probably anybody else in many, many ways. Hmm. And, and that what he was talking about, the, uh, the subtle self and so on, it was something which was to some degree generated out of the DNA, you know, which again, is not all that, you know, invalid in terms of what we're talking about. We accept a commonality of our physical nature, you know, as, as human beings and, and this kind of stuff too, you know, but. Yes, okay. De definitely, definitely, yeah, there is, boy. Boy, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very subtle point. I have to go through my mind here, but he was. It wasn't. It was. I don't. I don't. I don't think he was ruling it out, and, and I, and I, okay. ruling it out. But at the same time, too, I think he might have might have thought that, you know, boys, this is what I have to investigate too. You know. Yeah. In um, yes, Maharaj. One of the things which uh, I have studied a few books on Western intellectual history. I won't say very deeply. But I have a reasonable level of familiarity. So he seemed to be, uh, you could say, the least hostile toward religion. Like Sigmund Freud was quite, uh, Sigmund Freud was his, in one sense, his teacher, but he was, he considered religion almost to be like a pathology um, or a childhood, uh, childhood crutch, which one you should outgrow. But um, Carl Jung, uh, there is this famous quote that he says that, um, among all the patients that I have treated, I think this is a well-known quote. In 30 years, I have treated many patients. Among all my patients in the second half of life, 
every one of them fell ill because he had lost that which the living religions of every age had given their followers yes and none of them yes. was really healed who did not regain his religious outlook yeah. so he does seem to be distinct in the sense of uh, appreciating at least if not ontologically but at least you could say psychologically or uh, practically the value of religion he um um i think his, his father belonged to some kind of like uh, um uh, swiss church you know protestant or something like that it wasn't exactly like lutheran or something whatever it was you know um uh and and he he could see that his father as i'm understanding was becoming so frustrated because he couldn't kind of go beyond the uh first there was religion as karma you know as ritual i, I am i am jew i am muslim because i do the ritual and he, mm-hmm. and he young just it wasn't satisfied with that if the rituals were working that was something else you know but so many mm-hmm. times people just identified with that you know? then beyond that of course is rigid religion is gyana you know gyana where you start like we're we're doing talking about it intellectually you know and 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 mm-hmm. of course it was very prominent in the swiss community and his family and everything else but even still that wasn't satisfying because karma gyana and and then we then then when you start to get to the level of uh, dhyana you know mysticism and these kind of things and i would say because of his previous karma that's where jung was it was situated and he was having experiences from the time he was a child you know about uh, about that you know and so i think he was you know again he he was he was not rejecting ritual but he was rejecting the amagraha rejecting you know em- empty ritual or even perverted ritual you know that was was causing bad things in the name of religion and he was rejecting intellectualization which was which was considered you know as as the end and so on and he was coming to the platform where there has to be a mysticism within religion and the next step bhagavan because you want you come to the level of bahunam jamanam mante ganavam mam prabhajan de vasudeva sarvamiti samahama sudulabha once you come to the level of, of vasudev consciousness it's like you can look through a you know a fence with you know these chain link fences with wires you know you can see a lot through those things you can't go through but you can see so many things so once you come to the level of mysticism in your religion then you then the experience of bhagavan is starts to be very compelling if you're progressive and so another quote is that somebody i, I think this is actually on the youtube it was a um, you know I, one, one or two interviews were actually there and somebody asked him do you do you believe in god and he said we have to be you know perfectly honest i, I don't know if there's a god or not you know as, as a person in that sense you know but i think that anybody who claims to be a psychologist you know has to investigate this without a doubt mm. so i don't know if there's a god or not but i do know that if you don't believe in god you'll go crazy oh okay Yeah. So that is, yes. yeah. Preparing yeah. for this podcast, I was looking at various whatever I had read about Young. So I found this quote also something similar to what you're saying. I could not say I believe. I know. I have had experience of being gripped by something that is stronger than myself, something that people call God. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There is this inf- quite an influential modern uh, psychologist, Jordan Peterson. who says he has drawn a lot from carl jung oh yeah and he also is that way non committal he says he is non committal about god he says that the way he puts it is that i don't know if god exists but i live as if he exists oh yes yeah <laughs> you know um the pascalian wager no pascalian wager yeah Yeah, and Albert Albert Camus, of course, French also presented. He said, "I'd rather live as if there was a God, and find out there wasn't, than live as if there was a God and wasn't a God and find out there was." Oh, I didn't know Camus said that because Camus seemed to be quite an aggressive atheist, from what I read. Uh, he, was, he was a nihilist in the sense that he rejected tradition yeah. quite a bit. At, at the end they're saying there was a lot of uh, uh rapport and and conciliation with the catholic church in in his life oh okay everybody's changing 
Yeah, and, and that, most of the people, that's the point, they're, they're, they're evolving in their philosophy and culture. So it's important to know, so I'm trying to find somebody who knew how Jung's ideas were developing and so on, and how they developed since him. Yeah. Um, historically speaking, again, he was born into the, born into the culture in Switzerland, you know, a very clean, pure atmosphere. Um, and his father was a priest, I think his grandfather and uncle also, in a small, small town, village, small town, some valley. And then at that time, uh, psychology, as our reading goes, was, was very bad. If you, if you were psychotic, you know, and talking to people in dysfunctional society, if you were poor, you'd be like, like driven on the street and, and somehow or other just, you know, beat, beaten and, you know, just basically killed, basically. Um, yeah, there seemed and, to be that association of, sorry, there seemed to be that association of madness with crime. That if people are mad, then they will become criminal. And that's why they have to be like strictly controlled, put in some uh, remand homes or uh, are, it was quite, quite ghastly. Um, oh. yeah. I don't know. Yeah. What, was it something yeah. like that in India also? I haven't read anything like that. But it does seem to be prominent in, in Europe at least at that time. Especially as Jung makes this point at that time, he said before every village um, had a few interesting people. <laughs> interesting. You know, oh, Mr. Yeah. So-and-so. And there was one when I was in Calcutta preparing for our science congress in 1995, uh, one year there. We were in, in uh, Raghunathpur, which is out near the airport. And we wanted, you know, it was a little area and stuff, you know. And there was one guy, one guy, he was maybe like about maybe 27 years old. And he had the intelligence of something probably like about of like about a four year four year old child, you know, and he he just belonged to the neighborhood, you know. When he needed a haircut, somebody would grab him like a kid, and he he would he was like submissive, you know, and stuff and and stuff. But he couldn't talk so well. Some words they would just take kind of take him off. He needed, he needed a haircut. He was frightened, but a couple guys would laugh and keep him there and he'd get a haircut and they can get him bathed, and then they would. He would give him food and with some work to do unloading bricks, he would be walking by. They'd grab him and say, whatever his name was, you have to help. He would help. So he was like a little child of the neighborhood, you know. And um, and so as Carl Jung said, uh, the same way it was, the people like that could be absorbed into the village culture because everybody knew everybody. But he said with industrialization, it, it became more and more impossible. And that's when you just had to eliminate these people. Somehow or other, you know, you know, and of course, there's some idea of also being possessed by devils and by ghosts, and you know, they'll they'll get us. You know? So oh, he was yeah. growing up in that atmosphere with psychology, and he would, was trying to argue between. He was having these experiences, you know, which which we, we I think we would classify quite happily as you know experiences of Hiranyagarbha, you know, a little above the Virat Rup, you know, below Paramatma, above Virat Rup. You know? different things happening in the, in the Catholic Church and, and so many things which were quite elevated experiences and nobody with whom to discuss them and how to organize them himself and you know delivering and discovering a lot of you know, deeper tendencies in his own nature for construction and, and things like that. So anyway when he went into the university finally uh, I think he opted for medicine rather than rather than something hard sciences finally the psychiatry was, you know, was coming out of medicine at that point. So as I remember, his professor was one Bueller, one of the very first people to, uh, to really start trying to investigate the mind in more like a scientific mode. And they were using techniques like free association. You know that? Free association. Yeah, I'll, I'll, say, yeah, I'll say a word and you say the first word that comes into your mind. You know? Okay. Blue. Don't hesitate. Sky. Uh, uh, ugly. Porcupine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, now what's happening is you're having a lot of what's called latency. You know, so okay. so you're, you're a person who, who who has a hard time letting letting their their internal self go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, India. Spirituality. Okay. Wife. Life partner? Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you see, this is very dangerous, you know? Yeah, very dangerous. I've done this with people a little more open and, and stuff. And after a couple of words, something comes out where they, they, they just 
cover their mouths and everybody laughs and everything else. Okay, yeah. So the, um, they started having really good effects and people were starting to come out with, they could let things come out, which was, which was behind their, their personality. And they started coming in contact with the psyche and measuring latencies and the word associations. And, and from that, they started to develop an idea about what is the structure of the mind. So Shonu Shamdashian in his book, he gives, it's, you, know, you can have the history of the West in terms of war, in terms of politics. And that's usually what happens. Almost all you know, history books will take you, okay, this happened, that politician, and this you know, scientific development, this war, that war. Yeah. Um, but, but, but the Shonu Shamdashni's book for intellectuals, it's, an, it's a way to look at the development of intellectual thought in terms of the self and the mind. And there were so many people, Benet and other people in France and everybody else developing these ideas. Jung was just a part of it. You know? uh, and they were developing an idea against the self, the mind, the dreams, what their function is. And finally, he came in contact with Freud's uh, work, which also involved the subconscious. Jung didn't like the word uh, unconscious. Prophet also didn't like the word unconscious. <laughs> oh, is it? Said, yeah. Was, but was, I, I unconscious is almost universally associated with Jung, isn't it? But he didn't like that. He said the subconscious. He said, why call it the unconscious? He said, it's unconscious now, but as soon as you think about it, it becomes conscious. Oh, and, okay. And, and many things that we just don't deal with, if we, with a little bit of experience and ability, we can contact them. And so, that, again, it was exactly the same way as Prabhupada was looking at it. You know, yeah. So the uh, subconscious, the, under, the subconscious mind was starting to be investigated and, and thought about. Uh, and then, so, so then he went to see Jung. They exchanged some ideas, I guess, by letter at that time. And, and Jung had about maybe like, you know, 20 minutes for him in the morning. And once they started talking, Jung canceled all of his, his medical appointments for the entire rest of the day. And they sat talking for like eight hours together, you know. And so uh, Freud was... Freud was about the age of uh, Jung's father in some ways, you know. And so for years, as I'm understanding this, it, for some time it went ahead and, and Jung was like the protege and he became president of the uh, manager, whatever, of Freud's society. But then there were certain specific things. Uh, they even traveled together. They shared, you know, hotel rooms in Chicago, apparently, everything. They analyzed each other's minds, you know, the psychoanalysis of each other. And, and, uh, very intense relationship, but there were certain things that Jung felt where Freud was actually limiting himself, where he was too much obsessed with sex, too much obsessed with sex. Mm. There were other things in life besides that. And also where he wasn't accepting uh, real mysticism and the physical, you know, physical force of mystical things within the gross world and stuff, you know, specific things. So finally he felt, I have to go on. If I want to go on, I have to go on by myself. And that's where he started to separate himself and present ideas. And then finally there became this, you know, this, some, I was listening to Jung, the antagonism was mostly from Freud's, Freud's side and Freud's followers more than anything, more from Freud's followers. And he himself just wanted to go ahead without, you know, Freud, Jung, and I think it was Adler, those two were the most powerful at that time. And Jung said, we have all, well, all of our own ideas, you know, ways of looking at it. We're just starting off. You know, why should there be so much conflict? So then after that, he was um, in the morning times, he would have, I think he would have his patience. He was his patience because he, he investigated all of Western philosophy, Western history. One of the symptoms of a Samstapaka Acharya is that he synthesizes all the previous Acharyas and presents it. And that way his followers don't have to go back themselves. You know? so, so Confucius did the same thing. Confucius synthesized all the previous you know, uh, social philosophers and everything else before him and then put that into his philosophy. So Carl Jung the same way. When, once you, you study Carl Jung exhaustively, you already would have studied uh, Nietzsche, uh, who, who was, he, 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 he knew people who knew Frederick Wilhelm Nietzsche. He talked to them. Okay. You know? And he walked the same streets that Immanuel Kant walked, you know, yeah. And so the, the parampara is there. And he took it back then to the alchemists who were, who were the alchemists were, were a very, very valid competitor 
for the for the control of Western thought. Uh, the alchemists, alchemists. yeah. I thought alchemy to... was discredited right from the dawn of science. <laughs> no, is it? Okay. There's a very, very good essay by Harvey Cox, uh, which was done for the Bhakti Vedanta Institute, uh, Synthesis of Science in Congress, Science and Religion Congress in 1984. It's published by the BI. And they asked him to give a history of science. And Harvey Cox, of course, is from Harvard. So it's called uh, Science and Religion. A lover's quarrel. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. And he says, I offer this as a little little gift on the uh, on the anniversary of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's appearance, whatever, and always you know bringing us Radha and Krishna. And he talks about it like that. He says, two lovers. They at some point they say, I'm never going to talk to you ever again. You know, and they both know that they can't they can't do it. You know, so <laughs> okay. So, so he points out science. He said the first person we might call a scientist, proto-scientist, were of course amongst the Greeks, you know, before Aristotle. And by the time it came to Aristotle, we're really looking at the roots of science, and and, mm. and, and we are really, you know, descendants of Aristotle, Aristotelian perspective. But that's another another discussion. Mm. Science in some religion. ways, just sorry to interrupt. In some ways, Aristotle and uh, mm. Plato, their relationship was somewhat like Jung and Freud, because it seems that uh, uh, Aristotle focused more on the empirical, yeah. whereas uh, whereas Plato was focused more on the inferential, and he was more into the essence of things, try to understand the essence. So I thought it's more like he was in more into Anuman. Yeah. He started Anuman as the founding basis, and then uh, then come to the Pratyaksha, whereas Aristotle wanted to start from Pratyaksha and then. Come to whatever Anuman was reasonable. Yeah, yeah, and of course, before uh, Plato's guru, of course, was you know, Socrates. 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 And you read Socrates; it's full of all kinds of religious rituals and and participation. He was doing all these things. It was just part of his life. He accepted there are gods, you know, and we and they touch our lives. So you're seeing it is a whole genesis from Socrates to Plato to Aristotle to the group to the. Uh, uh, getting into this now, to the Arab philosophers in, in Spain, and there to St. Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. St. Thomas Aquinas rediscovered Aristotle through the Islamic scholars, otherwise he wasn't there. And he's the one who said, told, uh, said he was following Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas was following the analytical view of, view of life of Aristotle and Bernardo, San Bernardino, San Bonaventura was looking at life in a synthetic sense. One of the tourists said, "You want to understand the the uh, the, the the bunny? You you live with him. You see what he eats. You talk with him. You know, you in, integrate with him." Uh, analytical view of uh, was to cut off his ears, pop out his eyes, pull out his teeth. Okay, and now we know <laughs> the rabbit. And the Pope officially declared that Aristotle's semina, uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas's ideas, would be the official philosophy of nature of the Church. So that's the history of how we're looking at it, you know, and, and we don't and other other modern modern people Nobel Nobel laureate candidates are saying let's go back the other direction, and start being synthetic with nature rather than analytical. You know? but that's a whole whole different thing. But that's but it's related because that's what Jung was coming out of, you know, and he was trying and he was Chunishan Dashni is pointing out he was trying to bring psychology to the level of being an analytical science that would be accepted and being able to give those results. But at the same time, appreciating through the Mithra cults in Rome, uh, he went to Africa. He was participating in their programs there. He went, he went so far into Africa that the two you know, uh, black police officers with guns who were sent to go with him were becoming frightened. You know, and then he was put in, in rituals with tribal people and talking with them. He really penetrated, like I'm saying, he was a, really an acharya. And the, the alchemist, okay, according to Harvey Cox, there were two groups of philosophers developing at the, in the beginning. There were the mechanical philosophers and the alchemists. And it goes back to uh, uh, par, 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 boy, Magnus and Paracelsus. Magnus and Paracelsus were two of the guys. And, and there was a competition, who's gonna control these things? So in the end, the mechanical philosophers who became the physicists, and their point of view, won. 
And so then uh, chemistry then became the second class science. And, and alchemy, of course, got, you know, and his, alchemy was never developed fundamentally. But many of the principles of alchemy that uh, we, we agree with, you know, for example, alchemy uh, in, it includes macrocosmic and microcosmic resonances, okay? That if I move my hand in a certain way and make a certain, you know, mudra or something, that has a, an echo, uh, which goes to the primordial principle of hands. I have hands, you know, birds have hands, uh, ants have hands, the gods have hands. So they accepted this, this uh, what do you call it, macrocosmic and microcosmic resonances in the world. Uh, another one was they accepted everything has meaning, right, which is very related like that. And these were principles that it weren't there in the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, the mechanical philosophers. And so we see physics. Marat, just know, a minute. Sorry. So when you are using the word alchemy, it's not simply in the sense of transforming iron into gold. It seems to be a whole well-developed school of thought, is it? Yeah, the quintessence, the fifth element they were aiming at was to get back. They were trying to refine things, on a, not just a... Um, a physical level, but also on an essential level. What is the self? Who are we? And it was it was meant to be a character transformation. Just to see everything was had meaning. So understanding physical nature meant to be a character transformation transformation as well. That's remarkable. So that and seems to yes. be much that seems to be almost like the sadhana we do for purification. And then yeah. we also do like when we do deity worship, we do some kind of bhuta shuddhi. We purify even the elements. <clears throat> You can imagine if if, if Jung, Jung, at, at, uh, Jung at 18 years old moved into uh, to, uh, you know the Boston Temple or something, the London Temple. You know he would, yeah, you know, the pujari rituals and everything else. Yes, he. That's the point. But what I was saying is that by, by approaching him, you begin to see the the possibilities in our rituals. Yeah, and ask yourself why are we doing them? It's not just because you know, and Prabhupada would tell you it's not just because. Prabhupada said, but no, there are certain reasons why certain mudras have a certain effect in the body and, and, and mm. things like that. Why we have five generations on the altar. So five, you know, there's certain yeah. reasons. Yeah. So, so now I'm getting a clearer sense when you said about the analytical and the synthetic. So it seems Jung was more approaching life as it was lived rather than simply as uh, from what I read about Freud, it was more of uh, he was observing patients on the psychologist's couch, but not yes. so much so much in the real world. So one of the things I read about Freud was that he studied, he primarily studied pathologies, mm -hmm. and then he inferred about humanity from the pathology. So, yeah, again, I think that was another contrast that Jung was more interested in studying healthy people. Yes. You know? Well, I say, well, yeah, as much as he took it all, he took it all as all as the thing, but he was, you know, yeah, everything, but he was also a doctor, you know, so he would have his time with his patients and stuff too, and study mm -hmm. them. But many times by pathology, you can understand healthy, healthy being, because in the pathology, you see when things aren't, aren't as they should. And now in the contrast, you can see, okay, well, what, what has, what has taken this out of the norm? You may begin to find out what the normal is, what's missing there. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So Maharaj, just, uh, I don't know whether this is going on a tangent, but uh, mental health doesn't seem to have been a major concern in say Indian, Indian intellectual history, as far as I know. There's a lot of analysis of the mind per se, but uh, in the Sankhya as well as in the yoga, but that is more for the purpose of transcending and getting liberated mm -hmm. uh, not so much for um, mental health as a dimension in itself now we are of course many devotees are trying to i said draw insights about psychology from the yoga texts or from sankhya and then see how that can help in managing the mind but is there any historical reason for that or is it like mental health is a problem that becomes prominent after a certain level of physical well-being and prosperity has come and uh, the West had that to some extent at least after industrialization whereas India never had that and 
at least in the recent historical times. That's why that problem was not highlighted. Uh, again, you know, I, I mentioned that one about Mountain Lake. When Car so Carl Jung, he was traveling all over the world. He went to Africa. He eventually went to India. Uh, and he went to the U.S. And this is all 1930s, where 20s, you know, 10. And he was also investigating the, the philosophical roots of all these places, the literature and stuff. So, you know, again, he's, he was able to synthesize Nietzsche, Kant, all these things. And when you read him and the, the Shundashini's book, uh, you know, Carl Jung and the Making of Modern Psychology, The Dream of a Science, it just is so profound, so well researched. This is something which is very strong in the Jung, Jungian heritage. There's extremely good scholarship, good, satisfying. And so when you do that, you, you, you know, okay, this is how we got where we are in terms of our view of reality and everything else. So when Jung was with uh, um, this one shaman, I, mean, I mentioned this before, maybe he was, his name was Mountain Lake. He was a Hopi Indian shaman in New Mexico, I think. And they're very famous to this day. They've maintained their culture and their, 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 their uh, language is a different kind of basis in the way it deals with reality and they, the way they deal with the reality. They maintain their culture. So Jung was talking about these ideas he had uh, and, and he asked, well, why, why is it that your people think that all Europeans, you know, are, are, are crazy? You know, when people coming from Europe and there. So Mountain Lake said, he said, because they say they have thoughts in their heads. You know? And Jung said, well, hey, you know, of course, where else are you going to have thoughts, you know? And Mountain Lake said, only a madman has thoughts in his head. A sane man has thoughts in his heart. And, and when he heard that, Carl Jung said, perceptive guy, everything else in perspective, he said he was so shocked that he just couldn't say anything. He was just like sitting there, this shock, you know, for maybe one minute, two, <laughs> two minutes. This is in Mountain Lake being a subtle guy, just let, let Jung go process a, a, you know, a gigantic world change. And he said for the first time in his life, he actually realized how other cultures looked at Europeans. There's a, a, a black poetess from South Africa. I think it's, I think it's one. And she says, a woman thinks with her belly. <laughs> okay. A man, <laughs> okay. yeah, a man thinks with his, with his heart. And a white devil, he thinks with his head. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we got some brown devils, you know, listening to this now too, you know. <laughs> but that's the industrialized society. And the, you know, woman is thinking about you know maintenance, survival, you know, very things like that. Nor said more tendency, a tendency. You know, with the heart, this is where the seat of the booty, you might say, the heart. Okay, mm. when I'm there, then when I move into the mode of passion, I, I start thinking with my head. You know, planning all these kind of things, time factor, what's going to happen, and the mode of ignorance, and I move into my senses and the sense objects. You know, so this is very nice analysis. You know. And so, so Carl Jung is the point in the mode, in the mode of goodness, we're, 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 uh, the chitta, the cheta, the, the cathexis is in the heart. <laughs> My heart here. Okay, there we go. Okay, in the mode of goodness. You know? yeah. But then when it moves in the mode of passion, when the, when the morning program is over and the sun comes up and the bank's open and the, uh, the business is open, okay, what kind of booty have I built during my morning program? How much was I able to assemble a basis, a perspective, a baba, an attitude, you know? And then when I confront all this activity in the mode of passion, got to do this, got to be there then, what can I, you know, his cake is bigger than my cake, you know? Yeah. Then we're goal-oriented. Then, we're, then we, we have a basis why we're doing it. I'm making money for Krishna, right? And somebody else is making money for his family. Somebody else is making money for his, you know. And then when the mode of ignorance comes and the happy hour comes at six o'clock at night, Alcohol, half price, you know. Uh, of course, the happy hour for devotees is, you know, is, is Brahma Mohorta, you know. So, and the businessman, he's unhappy. Oh my God, if the banks had just been open a half an hour more, I could have finished that deal and I could have made so much and I could have done so much, or I could have, you know, finished that correspondence and our nation would be safe, you know, mano maya. But the fool, okay, now he's happy at six o'clock and now he can just take things and eat things which will force them to be absorbed into his senses. You know? And that's what he wants. 
So Jung was having this in the Kundalini in the Kundalini lectures. You could quote, when I had I had to give a lecture on that at, at the university, at national National Library, the National Library of Peru, big program. The head of the Psych Psychological Association was there. Several people, very prominent. So I wonder, well, what am I going to talk about? My presentation was, you know, Jungian was Kundalini Yoga, and right that morning in the class, as so many times happening, which, which, which Jung, would, Jung would call a synchronicity, you know, but things happen. Yeah, there's, there seems to be the hand of God in things. The, the purport was all about probably talking about Kundalini Yoga <laughs> before, and that afternoon I had to make my presentation on Kundalini Yoga. So I just did exactly what Prabhupada did. I presented it that way, and people, well, it's a nice way to look at it. And, is very complete. So when he when he's talking about the chakras and everything else, you can see Anamaya, Pranamaya, uh, Manomaya, and and then and that's about as I would say Jung's Jung perspective, my experience, he's just about up to the throat. That's where he's hanging out, you know, in terms of his body bodily conception like that. He says we Swiss people do not like to talk about anything below the belly, that's why below the diaphragm, you know. But he said, Germans, many times, they're quite happy talking about their guts, you know. Ah, gut essen, ah, ha, 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 you know? And he says, when Swiss people come in contact with this, they feel, oh, my goodness, you know. <laughs> yeah. So their, their culture is, okay, you know, some com prominent consciousness in, in the, that, that level. But Swiss mm -hmm. people are more upright, you know. So again, I, again, I would say Jung was at this level. That's where he starts to say he comes up to the level of space as the element, and he's talking about space. Bumir apanalopai vayu kamano budeva akash space. And that's where he's starting to say it has it's spiritual. You know? Yeah, but if you're on that level, which is sound and everything else, then your psychological activities are much more accessible to you than an ordinary person. You know? Yeah. That's remarkable. So in one sense, now you use a two framework. By, by the way, by, by your body language there, I see you, you pull your eyes away, you roll your head back and you bring your bring your uh, your, your chitta back up into your head. <laughs> so you can go back to a linear linear organization for this conference, which I appreciate. Thank you. <laughs> That's fine. Now. That is quite a... Now, you, till now you're talking about two, you could say... Two ways in which you place Kalyang within, we could say, a Vedic framework. One was earlier you talked about the, like, with respect to his level of God consciousness or spiritual consciousness, you place it something like the Hiranyagarbha level. Mm -hmm. And then now you talked about the overall analysis of, you could say, self in terms of the level of the consciousness, where you place it at the level of the space. So, so this is very interesting. That means <laughs> we can, like, we can have a particular you could say self-understanding and an understanding of the divine. And at one level, both can go in parallel, but sometimes they may not go in parallel in the sense that somebody may, somebody may be ritually worshipping God, but they may still be thinking of themselves as the body. And they may think they may be worshipping God for material gains. So, so both these going in parallel is a uh, is I think what will lead to the holistic growth of consciousness. Yes. Um, Kanista Adhikari, Upadesha Mrita, some of you think, oh, can he probably talks about Kanista Adhikari, you know, smoking marijuana and associating improperly with the opposite sex. No, Kanista Adhikari can be also be a very pukka South Indian Brahmin family who does puja, you know, to the same deities for the last 32 generations and everything else. You know? 32 generations, okay. Yeah, because it can be Kanistadakari in the mode of goodness or Kanistadakari in the, you know, in the mode of ignorance. Yeah, yeah. The, sen this, the, the modes are influencing the senses or influencing the sense objects, the senses, the mind, and the intelligence. So we can get a different combination of those. Somebody may be pure, renounced, clean, everything else. He may be a very, very pure Buddhist monk, but in his, in his mind is control, no anger. But in his, in his booty, in his heart, he may be in the greatest ignorance. By doing all this, I will become God, <laughs> which is the greatest, the greatest yeah. possible insanity you can have. You know? So senses and mind are in goodness, but his intelligence is in the deepest, deepest mode of ignorance. You know? yeah. That's remarkable. Yeah. 
Yes. So, so you know, it's sometimes when you think about uh, consciousness, we sometimes quite have a little bit of a simplistic understanding mm. of what consciousness means, and this takes it at a much higher level overall. Mm. Yes. Chitta, chitta, no? Yeah, chitta. Yeah. Mm. Now, so does that kind of cover the history of how? How things were developing in Western thought, and how, and so finally, in the ninth, uh, into the modern twentieth century, uh, Jung was going into it. He in the West, he met with you know William James, the big philosopher. He met with him in the West. The variety yeah. of religious experiences. Yeah, yeah. You, so he met him. He, he they, they can, they when he came to America, they had a long, lot of so consultation and talking. And I think William James was a little bit older, but he very much respected him. He thought this guy's got good ideas and everything else. And it, wasn't that Jung was thinking I'm the only guy on the planet with any intelligence, but but uh, but many people, you know, he he felt were caught in a lower lower platform, you know. And so he himself, should I become an artist? Should I go on? He had many different challenges. Um, he married. Now here's the point of side, but he himself would talk about this. He would say people have their their certain necessities they have to satisfy. So as far as I understand, he married a, in a into a very nice family. Uh, his wife had, uh, you know, he brought, brought with her a good dowry in terms of that. And, and they, you know, he may married his entire life. But I, I think on the side, he may have had, you know, two or three relationships outside of marriage, you know, oh, which okay. in his culture, in his community was not considered the grounds for divorce. You know, it was considered like, all right, it's the things that are going on and certain relationships are there. And, Men have things they have to satisfy, and also he was smoking tobacco <laughs> and stuff. So yeah, it's some perspective. And I, but the thing was, I think in general that he was quite conscious of his his foibles and things like that, and understanding. I have I, these are problems I have. These these things are going on, you know. Mm -hmm. And he was yeah, he was getting he was a, he was a big he was an international figure. He was getting criticism from different angles and people like that, which would bother him. Then he went ahead to uh, involvement in the, the scientific community. He was trying to make it into a science. And he even, even went to the point of he was working with uh, Wolfgang Pauli. You know okay. Wolfgang Pauli? Yeah, yeah, I've heard of him, yes. Yeah, he was Nobel laureate. There's a book, there's a very, very good book, uh, Quantum Questions by Ken Wilber. I think I mentioned it. And it, it's, it's an anthology, it's an extract, an anthology of the, of the mystical writings of all the modern founders of modern physics, Schrodinger. And uh, one of them, I think it's uh, Louis de Broglie or somebody has, maybe it's Heisenberg, it's Wolfgang Pauli and his philosophical outlook. And in the book, um, he's giving a biography of Pauli. He says, as he says, he, amongst all the Nobel laureates there, he was one, one way is the most, most fanatic about you know, rigorous thought and and, and data and stuff. He was very, very, you know, fanatical about you know rigorous use of mental mental thought and stuff. But Heisenberg, I think it is, says that very somewhere along, maybe said very early in his career, uh, Pauli came to the limit of rational thought, you know, and at that point decided there had to be pre-rational roots, you know, things that happened in, in our consciousness, which is Immanuel Kant, as far as I'm understanding, and Nietzsche. Kant said, yeah, there had to be a, a priori things. You had to be able to, to break things into categories. You had to be able, yeah, what he called, he called categories, I think. Like you had to be able to see things as uh, unique, um, unique individuals. Like my, uh, I had to be able to see you as something unique. I had to see your glasses as something unique. I had to be able to see the microphone as unique. You know? And so Kant came up with these categories, which we had to have before we could have any hope of having any kind of rational thought or perception of the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Nietzsche took it into being archetypes, like, you know, things that weren't just impersonal categories, but the, the virgin, you know, the prince, you know, and things like that. The snake. Oh, okay. And then Jung then took it, I think, uh, you know, a step further, but working on Nietzsche's work. So... So um, Polly and, and Jung were actually starting to work together on, on a certain levels of, for example, certain levels of uh, uh, 
of guaranteed imprecision with, with quantum mechanics and stuff, Heisenberg's principles of uncertainty. And they really were working together and stuff. And so he was very much tied into the, West, the mainstream scientific community, you know, trying to make this bridge. And actually, historically then, when Jung was leaving his body, then he wanted to do a biography. He's getting older, he's gonna leave. So Anna Jaffrey, and Shona Shandashan, he says that a lot of it is not Jung's, you know, things. She actually wrote things in like, you know, which apparently, you know, Jung, Jung she, she wrote stuff that Jung didn't say, you know, it wasn't she was li lying or anything, but Jung didn't dictate the entire book, you know. And the other biographies he recommends, which are just openly, you know, collecting stuff and presenting them. So the biography, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections like with Anna Jaffrey and Jung is actually a autobiography and Anna Jaffrey's, you know, uh, comments. And they asked him, give us your, what you really think about things. And he said, if I told everybody what I really thought, you know, the, the, the theologians would all attack me <laughs> as being an atheist, you know, that everybody, the, the psychologists would say I'm mad, you know, and the physicists would say it's all just fairy tales. And, you know, you got to do it. You got to do it. He said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it, but it cannot be published until after I'm dead. You know, because oh, okay. I'm, I'm just a human being. How much, you know, public harassment can I handle from people? You know, So, and so when he left, one of the greatest things, he was finishing the history here now, when he was leaving, one of the most terrible things that he could hope for or expect was happening, which is quite, quite natural, was that they were, uh, what's the word? It's the word stultif not stultifying. Uh, it's the word petrifying. They were petrifying Jungian philosophy. This is this this is Jungian philosophy. This is Jung's view of the world. This is how what Jung, Jung says the world is like this. The world is like like world is like this like that. Um, Jung, what's his name? Ramon Mojica told me that his professor, who was a Jung, Jung's associate, said Jung said all of my ideas are conditional. And even in his literature, he says that again and again. We're just, I'm just, I've just discovered a few things that seem to be true, but we're just, we're just, and there's a quote I have there that introspective psychology, Jung says, I have it among my slides there, what wasn't born yesterday in the West, it was born this morning, you know, compared to Asia and places like that, we're, we're far, far behind them. You can look at those quotes later. Um, but he he was he was saying that they were my ideas and so and it's Shonar Shamdashni also entering into the politics now because in, to get your degree as a union analyst you have to go and live and pretty much live in Zurich sometime and work on it and stuff like that so Jung felt that and, and that's why also as I understand uh, he's saying that Polly left him left this left the uh, the community because he thought they'd done that they'd given up their sense of creativity their sense of intellectual honesty and investigation which he felt were Jung's greatest contributions, his honesty and his, his courage, you know, and, and, and they were just trying to make it into a stultified thing where they could now sell it, you know, and, and, and deal with it in that sense, which is quite natural. But, but carrying on from Jung into the modern world, okay, um, I think many, there have been a big, a lot of controversial lines and they fought with each other, Hillman and different people like that about what's going on and reforming Jung's ideas. And uh, Shonu Shamdashi and the Philemon Foundation has been dedicated to publishing a lot of the works. And there's a lot of resource material which was not available even for a hundred years after Jung left his body or, or did, did the materials like that. And so those are still coming out. And then um, trying to get involved in this whole thing in my own limited perspective, we're talking to people who are working there. Uh, we were invited to still come to the, the symposium in a, let me show my screen here now. So they said, oh, you, of course, you're coming to the, uh, this symposium in Santa Barbara, California, aren't you? And I said, uh, well, I didn't know about it. They said, oh, yeah, yeah, everybody will be there. So that's the level we got to on this level of like, you know. <laughs> and um, so, of course, we're in Tennessee. And I investigated the whole thing. It was going to be April 4th, 2019, Art and Psyche, the fourth, fourth thing. The Illuminated Imagination, okay. so sponsored by the Art and Psyche Working Group, Pacific Graduate Institute, which is very powerful, uh, Museum of Art, Design and Architecture, University of California, Santa Barbara, the Jung family, 
his own family, which got, got the copyrights to so many things, he passed them on like that, and something else, Aras, you know, yeah. Um, they were sponsoring this whole thing. It had been organized someplace, at four different places before it had been organized, three different places, and this was the fourth one, Art and Psyche. Uh, and um, I, so I investigated, I paid my money. It wasn't cheap, it was like $125 to register or something, you know. And then I talked to Gary Rais Maharaj because he's in Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara is down by Los Angeles. And it's one of the big campuses of the University of California. <clears throat> and I never went there. I went to UCLA and, and Berkeley and Davis and stuff. You know. But I know uh, Gary Rais Maharaj was um, you know, were there and I, I got a hold of him and he said, oh, so nice to hear from you. And yes, I would love to attend this whole thing with you. I didn't know about it, but, but I have to, I won't be there, you know. So, but I have one uh, disciple follower, his second generation devotee, um, and he said that he wrote a letter to him saying, I, I would host, I would just jump at the chance to host Maharaj myself, and you host him. So he said, yes, yes, very much. And he, he was a very nice devotee. I've forgotten his name now. Very nice. You know, his parents were devotees. I knew his parents actually up in Santa Cruz. You know? And he was working as the uh, cultural director at a, a pretty big uh, retirement community, maybe like 400 units or something, you know, and. And so he was, you know, he was, he was very happy with that because he could introduce nice ideas and stuff and pursue his Krishna consciousness. So I stayed with him and it was a big adventure, you know, all this stuff is so adventuresome. I had to rent a car, <laughs> invest that money. And on the airplane going there, there were people going to the conference and stuff and the Jungians, they were talking. And when I got, got off, I went to, I said hello to one guy and we, we started talking a little rapport and stuff. And they were people that could talk with you, you know. So when I, when I got off, I went over to wait for my one bag to come off. And, and this guy came with me and I, and I said, oh, you're also come to get your bag. And he said, oh, no, no, no. I just came to hang out with you. I wanted to associate with you. you know? <laughs> my goodness. And, and, and the women were very intellectual and also seductive. You know, for someone, here we are now. We're with women who are like insightful and dressing artistically and everything else. You know? So then... Um, uh, uh, I, I was, was going to go, go get my car, and he said, "Well, okay. Well, I'll see you. I'll see you at the conference." <laughs> wow! It's like I felt myself like I guess this is dangerous. I can see this is dangerous. Many times I've seen this. Many times, if you can get very much, if I can get very much seduced into this level of, of consciousness. And that's the question you're talking about: How much is it related to Krishna, and how much is it related to sense gratification? Your head cook. How much you're cooking the things you want to eat? How much you're cooking things you uh, you want to eat? So this is coming right down into the modern world. And so many people were there. Yeah, Shoni Shom Dashni was there. It's the first time I saw him, saw him live. Uh, Patricia Losha and um, that lady, she's, she's art critic for the, the New York Times. Oh, what a name, very nice person. So everybody was there and we were saying hello and everything else. And I was walking around dressed in my outfit and so on. And I learned so much. Um, the University of California, Santa Barbara, walking across the campus was like walking across, you know, the, the, the Rome during the height of the Roman Empire. You know, there were slaves being brought from foreign provinces, three, three <laughs> gigantic libraries, I mean, art libraries, and beautiful young men and women going around on motorized <laughs> skateboards. I, was, I had to find my way out of the park and everything else. And they had special parking designations for conference people. We had little signs set up for the, for the designated parking lot, Jungian conference this way, <laughs> followed them, you know. And, and uh, it's like, you know, follow the yellow brick road. And finally I got to the building, I came in and uh, I said, hello. And it was, it was like, you know, 25, 27 year old young men and women registering people, the volunteers, you know. And so it's not a dead thing at all. Many very, very active young people are participating in the whole community. And then the, uh, it was like uh, four days or something. We got here, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. But I couldn't even handle it. I basically took the morning program through, through it. And uh, and I think I, the afternoons were some sessions. I stayed for some sessions, but it was just too much, too intense. And, 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 and again, I could see so many ways that we could relate to these people. And, and, I, and so many people, I just, you know, broke into conversations with him. There was a guy from China there who had 25 people with him, You're developing yeah. Jungian stuff. And we got into a whole conversation, you know? So anyway, that's kind of like saying how, how it, it's, it's here in the modern world. It's a very active community. It's a, a certain kind of uh, 
kind of community. And, and, and I, Radhika told me recently, he talking to some person, and he didn't, didn't even mention to me or anything else. He said, you know, I think there's going to be a, another wave of Jungian consciousness. And it may be because of a little bit of contact with Prabhupada, you know, and stuff like that. That, that, that now they're, they're getting more ability to, to express their ideas and understand, understand what, what's happening to them without, without being able to having the, the organization, you know. So it kind of that's, you know, I think how it's, how it's developed. Uh, stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. How, how it's developed in, uh, in, in Jung's life, down, down, in, down, down, in, on, down into the modern world. You know? Is that two of our topics? <laughs> no, I, think, that, I think what you talk about is conference. That also addresses the third point which I was mentioning. How is it relevant today? So it does seem that in today's world, there are a lot of thoughtful people who are trying to gain more and more tools for say, un- making sense of life, making sense of oneself. And Young seems to be a very important resource in that endeavor. Um. Devotees who, who approached me on this topic, and um, I, I mentioned before, I think Bhakti Bhakti uh, Vignam Maharaj from Russia. Yeah, you mentioned that he said that young is critical for, is essential for reaching out to today's audiences. No, yeah, he said young is essential for our preaching. And I'm trying to make, but he, but he like I tried to contact him after that, but he was just too busy with administration and stuff like that, you know. Okay. So I think it's something that's happening in our own society. There's a lot of people who like this, but it's kind of like it has to get to a certain point where they can get a hold of it, you know, and stuff. Which I think is happening. More and more people are getting involved. So even within our own society, uh, everybody who I give these books to, Nitegor Sundar, Ravi Prakash Singh, head of geriatric psychiatry, <laughs> my boss here in Nashville, from Lucknow. Okay. Um, I um, he he read Jung's biography. And the same thing is that it's very interesting if you have a, this kind of perspective. It, it lo- allows us to look at Sankhya from a much more practical way. And also it allows us to look at our own psychological nature and character. You know, it's very therapeutic. Every devotee who I've, I've come in contact with, all of Jung's literature has been very, very therapeutic for them in developing their Krishna consciousness and purifying themselves. You know, so it's a wonderful resource for devotees. I mean, I have, just recently we had one incident in Chile where when devotees had a psychotic breakdown right in the temple and stuff, you know, and so the one devotee who was involved with it was trying to calm him down and use good, good psychological perspective, some idea about okay, this is a psychological psychotic breakdown and probably we're talking about it, so he'll snap out of it, but it didn't. So at some point then the devotee had to, you know, it's a girl, actually a lady had to start screaming and then the temple president came in and grabbed the devotee from the back and <laughs> wrestled him to the floor. <laughs> More devotees came and they called up the uh, psychiatric uh, police and they took him off to an emergency psychiatric ward. And then as a devotee, we could look at this and talk about it and, 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 and give perspective. And people were so happy. Okay, what's happening? Yeah, we didn't, you know. And we understand that it's, you know, you know it, it very, he, he was, he was pi- he was diagnosed bipolar. Nitai Gaur Sundar Das, Ravi Singh said, if you're a poor black lady, you usually get diagnosed psychi- uh, psych- uh, psychotic. If you're a rich white lady, you get diagnosed bipolar. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So anyway, he was diagnosed as bipolar, a rich white kid, and was on medication, but stopped taking it. And then apparently, you know, this, these things happen. So you have to go into it. We have the tools to go into it deeper. And the uh, psychologist in the first round, it came to exactly the same conclusion that I came to about what had happened you know, and so on, you know, when what should be done to the next step in, in dealing with it therapeutically. So Jung, yes, in the modern world, Jung is, I think, a very, very good tool. That's so why we're building bridges to, for, to that Western people can appreciate him. So many Western people, he comes out of that culture. He has that language. He has that respect, you know. And, but yeah, when they get our, our perspective and tools, then they can become a hundred times more effective in how to apply it. You know? But if you have somebody with psychotic breakdown, yeah, grab him <laughs> and hold him so he doesn't commit violence and just restrain him and call That's the police. Amazing. They'll give him a little bit of a, what's, what's it called? Uh, the name of the tranquilizers. <laughs> and he'll be happy. 
be peaceful for a while. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. So, Mahaj, this is remarkable because I have also had podcasts on topics like, say, uh, emotional or psychological challenges on the spirit on the devotional path. Yeah. Because to some extent, sometimes we presume that just by practicing bhakti, all mental problems, or emotional problems, or psychological problems will automatically go away. <clears throat> but it's not that simple. So, could you elaborate a little bit on this point? You said that even for devotees, it could be therapeutic. So, are there may uh, in in what way that just it gives us a better understanding of how the mind works, and then we can learn how to manage it, or in what way is it? Helpful even for devotees. Um, boy, that's big questions. What what is bhakti yoga? Uh, how's it go? Uh, Diksha kale, bhakti kari, atma samarpan. Okay. Say kale Krishna kari tari atma sam. Yes. The time of diksha when the devotee does atma sarpan, atma samarpan, fully surrenders to Krishna. Now, this is second initiation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When you take second initiation, either informally or formally, come to that level. Mm. Uh, at that time, Krishna takes him as good as, as himself. We, we're, now we're, 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 we're actually connected to Krishna in our life and our body and so on. So how many devotees have actually come to Atma Samarpan? How many officially have taken second initiation but weren't ready for it? You probably directly chastised temple presidents for submitting people who weren't ready for second initiation. So, so I would say at, at that point, when you come to second initiation, you've got some idea of your, of your, of your Varna Ashram, which of mm. course is very tied into your psychology in a big sense. When you come to the third initiation, I was talking about, which is Goswami or Goswamini, you know, formally or informally, uh, you, can, you can achieve it before, you, before you're even initiated with Harinam Diksha. But when you come to that level of devotional service and appreciating Krishna as a Paramatma, then, of course, these things become clear. You can see your mind. You can see your intelligence. You can see so many things. You know? So what level is our society at you know, as a society you know, in terms of the, the one million members we have? You know? Are they mostly Kanista Adhikaris who are becoming initiated so that the Acharyas can fill up their pockets? <laughs> okay. Some people would say that. Or are they actually okay. people who come to, Har come to Harinam Diksha and actually coming to second initiation? I would say yes. I'm I'm happy with my institution. I'm fighting against problems in my, my institution. But honestly speaking, I think it's the best institution in the world. You know, all glories to the GBC. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough job. You know? mm. And so, the, but then, but most people are not in this level. I don't think of they're not. They're not Goswamis. You know, they may understand the, the mind and these things in the level of Brahman, which is a very broad, you know, sense that there is a mind. You know, and and it's spiritual. Okay. But in terms of specifically what happens at the time of death, what happens during psychological things like that, you know, they're they're not experienced, you know, for the most part. You know? And so that's what I'm saying that yeah, if you if you follow the process of bhakti yoga as described by Bhagavaswami, accepting an acharya and applying it, yeah, doshrada, sadhusanga, bhajana kriya, nartanivriti, nishtiruchi, you know, you'll you you will experience these things. Everything will follow out automatically. Shraddha Shabde. Mm -hmm. Bhakti Kariya Manoz Shwada Shabdi Vishwaskahi Sudvid Anoinus Joy Krishna Bhakti Kwari Sarva Kama Krita Hoy. All the verses I'm quoting are, are cited in the Upadesha Amrita. Yes. <laughs> this is something else, the Bhakti Vedanta Library. If you follow the citations and learn them in the Upadesha Amrita, you'll have a fantastic understanding of all of our philosophy and culture. Yeah. yeah those are, so I, I, I can cite these, they're nice to refresh them. So yeah, if you disengage in bhakti, everything else will follow. But Prabhupada says, you know, uh, go to a medical man, go to the local authorities. Yeah, uh, see, I mean, I, I, it's even a citation somebody was telling me where Prabhupada was talking about taking their medication, going to a psychologist. You know, yeah. And so it's within the scope of bhakti yoga. We're neophyte; we don't realize this. The Prabhupada is recommending people: yes, take your medicine, you know, do these things. You know, are, have you taken your medicine? Yeah, yeah, because they, for for example, uh, bipolar, what is it called? It used to be called manic depressive syndrome. You know, they'd be called bi bipolar. You know, as if for some time you have intense energy, 
and you can just you accomplish many things and your mind is working twice as fast as anybody else's and you go into these slumps where you can't even get up to open the open the door open the door to answer the doorbell you know manic depressive um Hari Kesh Prabhu was 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 uh, diagnosed with slow manic depressive you know and these are our realities that people find so one uh medication for this that worked was uh lithium and nobody knew why it worked <laughs> but people taking you know some my, my, my gram, my, my, my milligrams of lithium every day it would, would would slow down these big modality switches like that and stuff you know? so i was talking with nithai gorsundra even just yesterday i was asking him you know because he said many of these psychoactive dr drugs are using he says if you look at the thing where it says mechanism it says unknown. unknown. Some of them they know, yeah, they, they know. For example, I forgot what the what is now, it'll come back to me. It's present in hot milk with sugar. It's one of the most common tranquilizers there are. Tryptophan. Tryptophan. It's one of the most common tranquilizers that are used. Like if our devotee ended up in the psychiatric ward in the emergency room, you may give him an injection or say, take this, and then submissive enough, he says, okay, this step, okay, thank you very much. We'll help you. Calm down. Okay, so tryptophan, it's very common. Um, I think Nithai Gaurasundra told me and his uncle, who's a food chemist for the US government, both said tryptophan is, is present in hot milk with sugar. So you take hot milk with sugar, what happens? Boil it three times, bring it to you, sip it with the sugar in there. It goes right to your head. <laughs> you can just feel yourself just down. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's there naturally. Naturally, it's there and stuff, and we're taking it. Probably recommends it every night. Take your, take your tryptophan. Yeah, yeah. So, but but in some ways, the mechanism is known. It 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 deals with these kind of you know neurotransmitters and that kind of stuff. But many of these things, the the uh, the mechanism is unknown. It works. Psyche, I tried. It works. We tried it on dogs, and it didn't kill them. And we gave convicts in prison the option of getting six months off their prison term if they'll take it. They took it, it didn't kill them. Then we tried it on, on poor black ladies and it didn't kill them. Okay, now we're gonna give it to rich white ladies because they have lawyers. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's that's the history. I'm being a little cynical okay. here. We'll say that's what happens. And it works. So, so much of psychiatry we have now is pragmatic. It doesn't understand Ayurveda, you know, things like that. But and but still, Prabhupada also saying, yeah, in, in an extreme condition, there are some things which work. If you can find, uh, I know somebody, I know it's my background. I know people who were on medication, but they finally got to India, they got Ayurvedic, good Ayurvedic doctor, and they solved the problem, you know, with, with simple certain food diet, you know. First off, they got rid of the problem, and then, then with some, some intense care. And after that, so it doesn't reoccur, avoid these foods, live like this, this is your problem. And they didn't ever had it again. And so Ayurveda also has great possibility for helping these things, you know, but it, it takes a different approach in terms of the analysis stuff. But if you haven't got that, yeah, I mean, other, you know, take your medication. You know? Again, I know one case I mentioned, which is that the person killed, killed, killed his father. He had the, his name was Uj Ujvaladas. Uh, he had the impulse control, maybe still alive. Impulse control of like about a, a, a four-year-old or a three-year-old. So when a three-year-old is frustrated, he just starts banging things and slapping his mother and crashing things. You know, he just he's just the impulse control is just so un, undeveloped. You know, but if you if you're like six foot tall and you know 35 years old and 100 and 180 pounds, you have that that much that that's the limit of your impulse control. He did at some point. He just killed his father. Like that and stuff. So he was in, you know, in a psychiatric hospital. I think it was after he became a devotee and was outside, you know, back with his father. See, we, he was in a mental health facility for, for the criminally insane. <laughs> it's called Vacaville in California and stuff, you know. Yeah. It's a whole story, you know, you can go on with this, but it's the same thing. Uh, maybe I, he, he overall, came out of the... <laughs> what you're saying is that overall, that there are, could be just, just that there could be cases of somebody getting physically injured, similarly, somebody can get psychologically also injured or damaged or sick. And there could be various ways in which it could happen. In some cases, in some cases, uh, medication may be required. And in some cases, uh, just as we might take medication, sometimes we might also take 
insights from psychologists like Jung, and that can also help in healing. Definitely. Okay. Peter Karmadas, case studies. My very good friend, he was Cuban. He was growing up right when uh, Castro had the revolution and he had this, there's some, some you know, serious traumas in his childhood with the, the revolution. His uh, father, who was a very big, prominent doctor, he was studying at the Sorbonne. He came back to Cuba and they had maybe like six ladies, you know, uh, ladies of color <laughs> serving in their house, their hacienda in Cuba. And, you know, so, so many things. But then they lost everything. They had to, to escape. His father showed him where he was burying the family jewels and then, you know, in the, the backyard or something like that and told him, you know, later on, you can't take his with us. You never get him up. I'm showing you where, where I'm burying all this stuff. And he said he couldn't exactly remember. You know, otherwise you'd go back to Cuba and dig it up. But he got out, I think, with his, with his sister and his mother and his father with just almost the clothes on their back. And then and in some ways they, they were lucky they didn't get killed. They came to the U.S. And of course, all of his medical certification wasn't accepted. So what he ended up doing was being a, a technician in a, in a mortuary before he'd been a highly respected, socially prominent physician and his father. And now he was there, you know, sort of squeezing dead bodies to get them to look nice and stuff. So it was a big challenge. And then Krita Karma grew up in the whole thing. And eventually he became a uh, devotee, my very good friend, actually, and stuff. He was You're talking about there. Krita Karma Prabhu, the scientist? Or no, no, different... no, Krita Karma. Krita Karma, okay, Krita Karma, okay. Yeah. And he was very, very competent in many ways. And he was came from like, it came from this background and socially and everything else, very good. Um, and then he went to uh, India when, the, when uh, Prabhupada left his body and he was there in Vrindavan when uh, Bhavananda was the, uh, were there as the, as the Zonal Guru. And he, he was the, uh, the temple, uh, temple it was called the manager, general manager, because he could deal with people, he understood India, everything else, you know. And uh, then the story of Bhavananda's homosexual problems and stuff came out and he got blamed for it. And part of it is, oh, you were inspiring this stuff and everything else, you have these tendencies and stuff, you know? So he became really upset by all this. Uh, and then he got expelled from India because he tested positive for HIV. So he was locked up in a jail with Matur with another devotee, you know, for about three days. And some, fortunately it was an Indian jail. So he got some, some kind of, you know, vegetarian food. And they tossed him on an airplane back to the U.S. and he had maybe something like, you know, $50 with him or something. So he told me his whole story. He, he wouldn't mind me telling it at all. He left his body. So on the airplane back, he was so angry at Krishna that he, he ordered ordered a, a, a whiskey bottle, the little whiskey bottles they have on the airplane like that, just to show Krishna that he was finished. <laughs> he says, Krishna, I gave so much to you. I'm finished with you. I don't believe in you anymore. And he said it was really disgusting and terrible, but he forced himself to drink this entire thin little bottle of whiskey just to show Krishna it was finished. Then he landed, uh, I guess I gotta kind of summarize here. Okay. Uh, it's very, uh, I, I, it's, you know, he landed in the US. It was, he, his sister sent the money. She paid for the ticket and he had $50. So he landed in the US in San Francisco. Was, he had jet lag. He went to the really poor part of town where he could get a ho you know, hotel room for like five dollars a night or something. You know, really drunken people and homeless people, everything else. He couldn't sleep, so he got up in the morning. The sun was coming up. It was maybe six o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning. It was summertime, and he went down to the do doorway to the hotel. Everybody else was still sleeping from their previous nights. And he thought, okay, my 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 new life starts right here. You know, I'm no longer going to be a devotee, and I'm going to start my new life. You know. So he went to the doorway and right across the street in a four-story hotel of the same terrible, terrible type, a, a person on the roof had climbed to the roof and he screamed at the top of his lungs, I can't take it anymore, and jumped off and fell three stories and smashed to his death right in front of, front of Krita Karma. And at that point, his, his, his background, what his, his thing was, he says that it, Maya was just right there saying, Welcome to the fun house, Carlos. <laughs> this is the kind of girl I am. I'm not disguising any, anything to you. It's your choice. You know, come on, I'm waiting, you know, to have fun with you. And if you want to come here, this is the kind of girl I am. So very ontological, you know, level. And he said he sat there, stayed in that doorway for two hours. You know, the, the police came and, you know, they, they investigated into somebody pushing everything else. No, nobody pushed him. <laughs> It was whole thing. 
he said he could see it was his choice. Am I going to go into this or not? Am I going to go into this or not? So finally he made the choice and he went into it. Okay, I'm through with you, Krishna. So he went through a whole series of things, which I'll cut out, which are also very interesting. Uh, and finally he came back to the point where he was trying to make a lot of money. Uh, he was really making his material life. He was had all kinds of intoxication available, everything else. And he, but he decided, oh my God, I, I have to go back. I have to go back and everything else, you know. So, so he went back, you know. Uh, and I can't. I think it was maybe it was before this or after this, but along with this, he was having these fall downs. You know, and he would go back and visit his old friends and stuff. And Sangha Sanjay would take him off, and had falling down into the intoxication. Or I think a couple times he had like not heavy but fringe homosexual fall downs. A couple of them. And then we'd be like, he'd come back totally embarrassed, humiliated, and maybe three years later it would happen again. And so like that, it was happening over, you know, okay, chant Hare Krishna, eat rice chapatis and doll. But it was happening a couple times like that. Over. So I told him, go see a psychologist. There's in Berkeley, there's people, there's one lady, she was Mexican, and she was doing it, you know, which was it was a dollar an hour or something you had to pay. So he went there. And, and, and she, you know, she knew devotees. She, she, she incorporated his japa into the, the therapy. So, okay, when you're chanting, she was Catholic. Okay, what do you, and she knew you pray to God. It's the same God I pray to. So this, this, until next week, I want you to chant your rounds. And I want to think, I want you to think about this when you're chanting. So you see, very integrated. And so after some time, he developed some rapport with her. You know, that it's called, what's it called? It's called transference and stuff and connection. And finally, the trauma came out. And it was a pre-conscious trauma. That means if you want to think about it, you can think about it, but you don't want to think about it. It wasn't a, something which you had to go into hypnosis or anything else very deep to get to. When he was a little boy in Cuba. His mother told him, never come home from school along this route because it's dangerous. Just to a real low class, you know, drunken area and that kind of stuff, you know. And so he may be like about in the second grade or first grade, second grade. So one day he disobeyed his mother and he came home through that route. This is a history. And some kind of, you know, perverted type guy, which probably because of his own background, kind of pulled him into the alley. And, you know, I won't describe the details, but he sexually molested him and used him for sexual gratification like that. Yeah. And so he came home in complete shock. And his mother is like looking, what's wrong? What's wrong? But he couldn't tell her because he disobeyed her. And she was afraid, oh, my goodness. So, so, the, so he, it's like a wound. It's, 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 you get a wound, physical wound. Yeah. And what do they do? They don't, they don't let it heal. They put some packing in there because it'll form an abscess. It'll close over on the top, but inside there'll be pus and contamination. So he was able to do that. He was able to compensate for it, close it over. But it was still there inside of him. So the technique was that the psychologist finally had him said, okay, I have this stuff here. Pick out some garment which reminds you of your mother, a hat or something, and put it on the chair in front of you. you know? Okay, <laughs> I remember that. These are powerful techniques. Uh, so he did it. Okay, now you, you, you describe the scene to me to go through it again. You're coming back, you're coming home, and there's your mother. And now this time I want you to tell her what happened. You know? And so he's talking to the chair with a garment on it. So these things, these archetypes, the clothes and everything else, they take us there, they bring us there. He expressed it, he told it, and he's, he's crying. He's going back to like uh, eight years old or whatever it is, six years old. You know, He's very dangerous unless you know what you're doing. You know? So, okay, so, okay, calm down, Carlos. It's okay, I'm here with you. I'm, I'm a lady. I'm one, of, I'm one of the serving girls. Okay. Now I want you to go and uh, t take your, your, your hat off there and put it on your chair, and I want you to sit in your mother's chair, and I want you to tell to, I want you to be your mother and tell you what she would have said. And that was it. And obviously his mother wouldn't have rejected him. She wouldn't, she would have started crying and hugging him and, and everything else. And they could have gone through it together. And that was it. He never had that problem again. You know? But as a devotee, everything that happened, we can see it. These are, what do we call, we call these are called um, vasanas, right? Vasanas. Mm. You know? and, and when will I become free from these? When will Nityananda free me from these vasanas? Some are good, some are bad, some are left, some are right. They're dealing with the subtle body we have, and they're also dealing with the ambience that comes with that. You know, there's a certain karma of material elements, of psychological elements in the Virat Rup, which come with that. And that's what Carl Jung was experiencing. 
So that those are the archetypes. The, the Varna Ashram, you look at that, every time it describes the archetypes, and I was with myself, I can see this. The, the Varna Ashram is a part of the Virat Rup. It's material. It's the highest material trap. Yeah? Uh, I will now tell you a poem by William Blake. Okay. <laughs> you know this poem, The Sunflower? You know this poem? And no, not really. So every, everybody in American school has heard this poem. O sunflower, weariest of time, who counteth the days of the sun, aspiring after that sweet clime, climate, where the traveler's day is done, where the youth pined away with desire and the virgin shrouded in snow, arise from their graves and aspire where my sunflower is longing to go. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, the, the traveler's day is done. There's an archetype. Everybody, you can, you can take it so deep, you know, at the same time too. The, the youth pined away with desire. The young, young man is, you know, full of youthful sexual agitation, taking away our life. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. I got it right. Yeah. It's amazing. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pale Verdon. And we see this, the, the girls, they, they grow up and they have more, they're, they're trouble with more <laughs> lust. They can't just pine, pine away with desire. They got to enter into a refrigerator physically and keep their bodies from driving them nuts. You know, Romeo and Juliet. So these are, this is all a part of the Virat Roop. It's being expressed in the stories of the pregnancy of Ditti in the evening. You know, what is it? Uh, Paranjana and his queen. You start looking at these things, you know, and you can put them into Shakespearean language. You can put them into uh, William Blake's language. And these were people who were experiencing these things. They were expressing them. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but Jung is nice because Prabhupada gives a certification to him. And, and uh, you know, there's, there's, I've, there's, I've gone that way in my psychological way. Yeah. So that's what I would say, that the, Jung was experiencing the Virat Rup. He was going the level beyond that of just of the Hiranya Garba, where it's actually alive and stuff. He and he was seeing how each of us individually have our own individual archetypes, and, and, we, and we also have the collective archetypes, which the the, the, the Paramatma represents them. You know, there's a uh, yeah, yeah. I can Maharaj, carry it away. <laughs> can you explain what you mean by the word archetype? Because you know, I because Virgin it has Shrouded different meanings for different people, but you are using it like. Say Varanashram okay. or Vasanas. Okay. In that context, what exactly do you mean by archetypes? Okay. I'll give another example. <laughs> this is good. We have one disciple, Nanga Manjari. Um, she was an educational psychologist, you know, very nice person, very educated. And she was saying she grew up, she's probably about maybe like 60 years old now, maybe something, you know, maybe, maybe 20 years ago, even when she was describing this. When she grew up in Peru, it was very, very much, you know, like the very standardized society. And at that time, all young girls did what their daddies said, you know, okay, you can go out go out with, with your friends, uh, but don't be alone with boys, you know, uh, wear, don't wear that, wear this, be back by this time, you know. So she, when she was growing up in Lima, it was very much, you know, rigid society in terms of what girls could do and stuff. Hmm. Maybe like India in the 1960s. <laughs> Is that gonna get us? Okay. Did you grow up in, did you grow up in India? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. You did. Okay. Uh, did, did, you, did you have sisters? Cousins, not immediate sister, but yeah, I understand. Okay. It's a very protective environment, protected environment. Yeah. yeah. Somebody have told me that you, you, you were never allowed to have a private conversation with a boy unless your father or big brother was there, someone like that. Yeah. And so when they were married, it was the first time they ever talked to a man alone, personally. You can in the school you can say hand me the pencils or something, but I remember, I remember that was that was you know, so that was how it was in Lima. So she she figured well I want to get free from this I want to be independent. So she got married okay now I'm independent. Then she got pregnant okay and then she had a little baby girl Daniela who's also our disciple Dropani, and uh, I don't know if she knows the story or not maybe she'll hear it for the first time. So anyway, so uh, Ananga brought Daniela home and she had to wash Daniela and burp Daniela and feed Daniela and, you know, and, and everything else. She said after a few days, she was looking at little Daniela, little girl baby sitting there in the, her crib. And she said this panic struck her. 
very deep panic. I'm, I'm more trapped now than I was before, right? Before I was trapped and controlled by my father, but now I'm, I'm more trapped and even more trapped than I was before. Because so, she has to, she's a track of the baby. She has to give her, her milk to the baby. She has to, you know, live for the baby. And so, so this panic hit her, you know. <clears throat> and, but at that point, then Daniela, her little daughter, which is mm -hmm. on the same, Buma, Burma, Bu, was it Bumandala, Burmandala, on the same Burmandala as her mother, you know, was picking up her mother's rejection, you know, and started to cry and, you know, and you know, everything else. And so Ananga Manjari said, but it wasn't like, you know, demanding. It was more like, you know, uh, I understand that I'm, I'm a big burden for you, uh, but what can I do? I'm completely helpless, you know, and, and I'm sorry, but that's by the position I'm in. Please don't abandon me. And so it was, it was you know, then her, her compassion was stimulated. And she said at that point, this archetype descended upon her. I... I'm a mother. Don't mess with my baby. <laughs> the whole thing came down on her. And it was it. At that point, she, you know, she didn't have to, to do anything. It was there. Being a mother is an archetype, which is a part of the Virat Rup. How you get it as your individual archetype, of course, depends upon your individual vasanas. Another one is the king. Or we might say, I mean, have you ever been a temple president? Oh, fortunately, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, exactly. Myself, I did the job a couple of times. And the same thing, too. I could see this whole consciousness came on to me where I could do it. I knew things I didn't know nor before, everything else. These are bhava, attitudes, perspectives, you know, consciousnesses. You know. And on that basis, then we think, you know, I, am a, I am a mother. Okay. Yeah. And again... When I enter into the kitchen, I'm a cook. That's, that's a, not, not so much of an intense, maybe, you know, uh, archetype, the cook, a you know, collection of these things. That's what Jung was calling them. You know? yeah. And so then we come to this point, oh my goodness, I'm, for example, sannyas, Prabhupada says the highest material trap is Varna Ashram Dharma, the highest material trap. And we can only go beyond that when we make friendship with a, a devotee. When we enter into a personal relationship with Prabhupada or through his disciples and the mode of goodness passing it, then we can realize, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a clever, clever, austere sannyasi. I'm, I'm not a, a good interactive podcast <laughs> dude. You know? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a mother. You know, yeah. Yes, and devotees, I had one, one disciple. Uh, she was saying after being a, uh, I need to hear now, you know, working in a nursery school and having your own thing. Some of the nursery school teachers would talk about staying with kids all day long and going home and having this mommy mind, the mommy mind. And they start looking at their, their husbands like that. Well, yes, yes. And they say, it's like, you know. So Maharaj, just to I, yeah. understand this. So when you said that that archetype of the mother descended on her, Yes. Is this, you're talking this more in poetic terms or is it in ontological terms also? Because oh uh, why I got this question is that in the fourth canto, uh, I think in the Dhruva Maharaj pastime at the start, it okay. described that various qualities are personified and then how deceit is born from whom and how some virtues are born from whom. So it's of course a complicated subject and we won't go into that. But when you talk about archetypes are you talking about something which are uh, that means when we assume certain roles then in some way some kind of uh, we could say either it can be an empowerment to do that role or it can be an entanglement in that role whichever way we want to whichever way we are approaching it but is it like some kind of uh, uh, some kind of uh, like in the Christian tradition, they have the idea of the Holy Spirit that enters into the faithful person. Mm -hmm. So is it something like that you're talking about? or Because I'm just trying yes. to... Yes. Um, okay. <clears throat> it's um, when Lord Chaitanya, what is it, Sanatana Shiksha? Yeah. 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 Prabhupada translated that. Um, those chapters, of course, explain everything. <clears throat> Instructions to Rupa Goswami, of course, explain everything, but it's just one chapter. So Sanatana Shiksha, it's all there. 
And Lord Chaitanya explains all the, you know, Bhai Baba Prakash, Taratmika Prakash, he explains all the expansions of Krishna. Then he explains the incarnations of Krishna. Then he explains the energies of Krishna. Okay. okay. And how the jiva can be, can, can be involved with the energies of Krishna and so on. <clears throat> so what we're talking about now, I think, is about the question comes up, daivim prakritim ashritaha, that is the external energy uh, material or spiritual? Is, and that's where it really is, it comes to the point is, is, is the Bharat Rup, does the Bharat Rup exist? Is it material? Is it an incarnation? Well, what I understood in the Bhagavatam is that it is Kalpita, it's like a conceptual, conceptualized tool for meditating on the Lord through the universe. Yeah, that's exactly. So that's what these things are. You know, they are, they are, it's where, it's the objective material incarnation of Krishna. Krishna never incarnates as an object, so it's not really true, but that's, that's what it is. Shiva is the functional material body of Krishna. You want to play with a kitty cat, you don't start smashing around with your hands. He's dirty, he'll scratch you. So you get a nice big thick piece of yarn and you can play with the kitty cat and the kitty cat loves it. So that's, that's the Virat Roop, that's Lord Shiva. Okay. So they are, we, 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 you know, it's just like water into a sponge, but they could not exist except for the fact that there is a personality behind them. You know, the whole thing within the Virat Roop is being uh, assumed at different times, the Yamaraj, you know, you know, the, the, the Kali Yuga, different personalities, Jivatmas are given that thing to, to, to animate the body of the, of the collective uh, sub the collective subconscious, the collective element of fire. Maybe there's so many fire gods and they then are given the, the authority, you know, to animate those 40, what are those 49 kinds of fire as mm -hmm. their bodies. And then we take up a part of that. And so they are present. It's like, just exactly like the, what, again, I mentioned my gardener is the guy who's, turns out is the guy who's in charge of the evening shift for the water purification for the city. So I'm, wow, this is the guy, my gardener, you know? And so now I have a whole difference of, every time I take the water knives, I think of him, you know? And, that, and, and I trust the water a lot more now that I met him. And also I, try, I take his information, what he tells me in terms of his character getting to know him and talk to him and become friends with him and give him a Pia Prasadam and his wife and stuff. So I, the, the water is becoming, he's like the personification of my tap water now. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. Yeah. And the gross five gross elements, those are like really separated. And then, but, but, but they're, how are they connected to everything else? And that's why I think it's presented several times in the Bhagavatam. You know? Yeah. And of course, these are, um, the personifications are not spiritual. Those, those again, yeah. those are parts of the Virat Rupa. Different people are empowering, and different people become the Yamaraj, become the Indra, become the Brahma. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah. this is a remarkable correlation. So then, are do we consider the archetypes to be uh, like a finite list that is given in the Vedic scriptures, or it is? Yep. How, how many how many bodies are there? Oh, countless, 8.4 million species, but countless bodies. Spe species, yeah. Species. And that, that's, that's it. There's a, a limited number. I'm sorry, you cannot be a horsey ducky. I, mean, I want to be a horsey ducky. <laughs> okay, okay. So you yeah. can say that archetypes are associated with the bodily forms then? Yep, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, that's and, why and then... also then with, with Varna Ashram. These are, because the Varna Ashram applies to human human form. And also Devatas, I guess, too. So then when you earlier gave the example of a sannyasi or a mother, that means you're saying that if somebody takes up that role, then that archetype sort of uh, infuses them with the, with the energy or the responsibility to do that role? The, um, Prabhupada said that initiation, the fire sacrifice and everything else, Prabhupada says, is a formality. You've already got a relationship with Diksha Guru. You've already experienced that. You know, we surrendered to Krishna on a personal basis at some point in the mode of goodness. I surrender to you. Please take me back. So the actual for formality with the fire, the guru, the vows, the devotees, the deities, he said it is a formality. 
but not a meaningless formality. Yeah. So these formalities, when they're done properly, that's what Jung was saying. When they're done properly, they have an effect. Yeah? So there's the, the effect that maybe we're going to you're going to wear you're going to wear a thread after this point, right? You know, something like that. But but the effect is that there is a change in your uh, individual in your booty and yeah, your babas and that 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 part of your body, your 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 intelligence body. You know, and a portion of that becomes your manas body, and a portion of that becomes your space body, a portion of that becomes your touch body, a portion of that becomes your fire body. So at, the, at the, all these levels, something can happen, you know, but especially at the level of booty, what's happening, uh, baba, you know, um, you, there, there's a change by the, by the range of Krishna and the higher authorities, you know, they go, okay, we're going to, we're going to plug in the plug. You know, and then the city sits all there. The electricity is there. The generator is there. The superintendent of the generators is there. But now then somebody says, the adults and say, okay, okay, now, now the, uh, the sewing machine's plugged in. So it's no longer just a piece of, of dead junk. You know, now it's a sewing machine, right? Yeah. So if the ritual is properly, if you're properly married and the conscious and everything else and Krishna accepts the sacrifice, which is there, the marriage sacrifice, and depending on how, how what kind of marriage it is, okay, then there's a certain change. Um, uh, when, when, okay, when do India? I don't know. Do modern Indian girls hold hands with guys, teenagers? Huh. Well, it depends. I mean, India has also changed a lot in the last twenty years. In the last ten years, also. <laughs> ten years. It's fast. So I would, I would say, say twenty, thirty yeah. years ago, no. Uh, in the last 10 years, we also even have yeah. uh, live-in relationships in common. So, yeah, because Indian girls know. people. Uh, we know at the time of the marriage, when you hold hands for the first time, astrologically, what happens? When you, when you, in the marriage ceremony, when, especially when you take your holy other's hand, what happens psychologically? Do you know? Astrologically? No, what Before happens? the marriage, you read the husband's left hand. After the marriage, I think you read the right hand. Yeah. At the time of marriage, there's a, there is a subtle exchange of half of the body. I think the husband gives the wife half of the body. Yeah. Okay. And in English, we say, uh, my, you introduce your wife as my better half. Yeah. In Spanish, you say, this is the other half of the orange. Yeah. So it's exactly the half of the body. So there is, you know, so... And even girls, even you, even you know, this is a big deal when you're growing up, you're an adolescent, you're 12 years old, you're going on dates with girls and boys and stuff, you know, t taking the girl's hand or letting, letting her, t letting you take her hand. Whoop, it's, it's a big deal. It's, it's shocking. Ooh, my God, we held hands last night. Oh, wow. <laughs> she lets you hold her hand. Yeah. <laughs> for, for a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So all the, the, these things are, they're, these external things have a definite significance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They are, they, so they are associated. Yeah. I guess I'm trying to understand. So you are saying that in one sense, we could say these external things are the ways in which uh, we connect with the archetypes. Yeah. With the Virat Rup. Yeah. Oh. Okay. There is a certain okay. thing about, you know, again, this is, you see there's so many things in terms of the, the world, which have, Krishna says, I'm the taste of water, I'm the light of the earth. And yeah. When some of these things are integrated with other things in a certain logical way, and they, they represent marriage, you know, something else represents uh, the coronation of the king, you know, yeah, yeah. Something else, what else represents the the, the renunciation of family life, you know, the the the, the Vanaprast stage in, in America. There's a definite Vanaprast stage which is going on, you know, and and you know, yeah, there's people they renounce the family. For example, turning. Turning over the master bedroom to your to your to your uh, your your son and your new daughter-in-law, oh, right? Okay. The pi private bath and having the whole thing redone, new 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 bed, new mattresses, re repainted, new flooring, the whole bathroom retiled, mm -hmm. and then you meet your new daughter-in-law and you say, hey, you know, I've been the father, mother of this, uh, head of this house, you know, I've been the lady of this house for 25 years, and now you've got you've got my son, and I'm, I'm he's in your care, and I'm I'm gonna, my husband, my husband and I are going to take over his room. We're kicking him out. <laughs> and if and if we come and visit, we'll stay there. We'll keep some things there. And we'll come and see you. Oh, thank you for coming, God. And we need your help. Yeah. 
but now you're the lady of this house. <laughs> you can see how this is your bedroom. You can see what the effect is. It's just, wow, is this, at that point you start crying and your mother-in-law embraces you and smells your head and boy, but you, you feel, my God. It's beautiful. Okay. So yeah, this is a big, I got a big job now and, and please so, mother-in-law, so please again, do come. All right, this becomes a, like a big subject, but again, I'm just trying to understand that. So you earlier talked about say karma and jnana. So, and then beyond both of them is bhakti. So we could say that uh, the analyzing the the archetypes in one sense is like the jnana aspect and embodying yeah, those roles yeah, yeah, is like yeah, yeah. the is actually was originally meant to be done through the karma aspect but if they this become yeah. but if they become yeah. dive, by uh, if they become disconnected if it has no understanding of the purpose then things become more complicated or things become lost you could say you, you've got it this is, this is a piranha this is the aha experience yeah Exactly. And so that's why we have a problem. It says, Prabhupada says, says karma, uh, karma yoga, action in Krishna consciousness. Huh? But it means that we're uh, karma mishra bhakti, jnana mishra bhakti, jnana mishra bhakti, you know, uh, am, amishra bhakti. Oh, we're primarily, okay. executing, uh, primarily executing it on the level of, of uh, what do you call it, karma. But we know the goal. You know, where's the go? Brahmandi Brahmatikam Bhagavan Jeev Guru Krishna Prasadi Paya Bhakti Lati. You got an experience. You protect it. And we know, okay, I've got to stop smoking. I've got to get up in the morning. I've got to channel these beads. Our, our major focus of connection on the yoga ladder is doing it. Yeah. But we have the perspective, you know. And maybe we're really weak in the jnana, but somehow by Lord Chaitanya's mercy, that experience is being maintained. But then we start to develop the jnana. Well, wait a second. And then, of course, the karma is much more secure. You start doing it properly. You know, with, with better, doing it more properly. That, that's why I'm supposed to be chanting on the beads. Now I understand it. I'll do it better. So then we move from basically now we're focusing on the jnana level, like right now. And the jnana is where it comes to poetry, you know, introspection, insight, our artistry, music. And this is where you see Jungians, again, they, they, you know, they're on that level, you know. They're on a good historical level, very strict historians, everything else. They got the money. <laughs> okay. They brought the original Jungian art, which is in Zurich. It took them like three years to negotiate it. And it cost them like about $50,000 to the, you know, $12,000, $25,000 for the museum in, in Santa Barbara University to bring Jung's original art, the big stuff, and put it up there. And they figured they got their money's worth with security and everything else, like anything. It was there for three months and they had so many you know, big exhi ex 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 exhibitions about it. But, and then the family came along and they were also introducing it. But that's it, yeah. It's, it's, if you've got the goal in mind, because Lord Chaitanya's mercy, then it's karma mishra bhakti. And it, like Maitreya was a, a jnana, he was a jnana mishra bhakta. And he had to approach it from the intellectual perspective. And once he saw, saw Uda, once his intellect was adjusted, he saw Uddhava and Krishna. And mm -hmm. then he could appreciate, wow, maybe at that point he became, a, from being a jnani to becoming a, you know, the bhakti, you know. And then when he was able to preach it to Vidura, oh, yeah. So maybe, I don't know, it's, it's been two hours here, maybe. My, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think we went over a lot of directions, but I just can, maybe one last point I I like to clarify. So what you are saying is that to some extent, it, if people are at the karma level, then it is only through karma mishra bhakti that they will come to karma amishra bhakti. And similarly, yeah. if they're at a jnana level, then then we they will need to have yeah. some jnana mishra bhakti options open for them. Most and only likely. then they will come to come to jnana amishra bhakti, we can say. Yeah. So in one sense, when Prabhupada started the Bhaktivan Institute, or say uh -huh. the kind of intellectual uh -huh. research you are doing, you know, yeah. so that will open doors for certain people. And uh, say, for example, people who are already very religious or very, they, ha they have the culture of going to temples and doing, and doing, we could say, rituals, not in a negative sense, but doing re religious activities. Mm -hmm. So for them, the Jnana Mishra approach might seem unnecessary. But yeah. for them, the, to the extent that Karma Mishra approach is opened, so in one sense, it's actually, uh, in a sense, reaching out in these ways, analyzing contem influential contemporary thinkers, 
it's actually an expression of lord chaitanya's compassion to open those doors of doors to bhakti through people who may not be able to walk through any other doors lord chaitanya's movement is sublime what does the word sublime mean what does it mean in physics did you study physics did you study yeah. chemistry at all sublime means above the normal it's what is what is a sublime state transformation in chemistry is that term <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't remember that sublime state. Okay, mm -hmm. if something goes directly from a frozen state to a gaseous state, not passing through the liquid state, is called a sublime reaction, sublime state change. Okay. Sublima, I think it means below the limit. I think lemma means sense perception. So it's below the level of, uh, an example of this is dry ice. Dry ice oh, dry is ice. Frozen, okay. frozen carbon dioxide. But okay. But but you see, you never see liquid carbon dioxide, and it goes directly to the gas directly. You try and try and put a, a lid on a, a thing of carbon of dry ice and heat it up; it'll blow it up. You know? hmm. It's a very 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 narrow temperature range where you can keep it in a liquid stage. You know, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 degrees centigrade is where you know it changes from liquid to uh, what do you call it to in 30 32 degrees. You know for for freezing zero and 100 degrees for uh, for water, but carbon dioxide it goes it, it just is maybe like two degree range or something. If you keep it at that, you'll get a liquid. Other than that, anything higher just pops right up. So we we take people who are eat, eating hamburgers and drinking beer and have two girlfriends, you know, and we're turning them into you know Ras Lila <laughs> appreciating bhaktas in the temple within within two, within two weeks. Even Lord Brahma is amazed at that. So, so I would say, yeah, somebody who's on the level, if they connect up through karma, they can, they can go very rapidly right through that. But what will happen is their karma will be, will be very quickly infused with jnana and very quickly infused with dhyana. It'll become, a, they'll understand why they're doing the ritual, and then they'll do it with, with, with meditation, with, scent, with, put, with poetry, with, you know, with booty, like that and stuff. But they'll still go through the, the karma, and the jnana and the, the dhyana stages but it'll be the fast route, you know? The Bhagavatam describes that. If you want to take the slow route, second canto, yeah, you stop off on this planet, you stop off on that planet, and maybe you have to stop off on Jnana for, for a little bit, but you go, okay, I got that, I got that. The thing is, it's Shahari Krishna, Shahari Krishna. I, I, I experienced that with, with A.C. Bhakti Vinata Swami. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just you know, have to spend a lot of time on the Jnana level, you know? But there's just something there. You have to get, you know, probably saying you have to get some kind of logic and stuff figured out a little bit, just enough, you know? And then enough, at enough point where you're actually coming, where you stimulate, you know, down. You know, so we'll see, for us, is smarnam, shravanam, kittenam, kittenam, vishnu, smarnam. You have to go through the, you know, avabhashta, smarnam, the stages like that. But again, it can be, it can, once you've got that bija, you know, you've seen Lord Chaitanya, nar, nartam das takur, so our Lord, you know, Lord Chaitanya dancing or whatever it was. And, you know, he, yeah, oh. he, figured, he figured it out. He entered into meditation and he was with Lord Chaitanya. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Science of the natives. Okay. So I want to thank you for getting a chance to do Hamlet and Arjuna. And today, well, we're, we're, our title we come to now is the Science, Psyche, and Spirituality, the Encounter of Carl Jung with the Bhakti Siddhanta of Classical India. Yeah. Oh, because Bhakti okay. Siddhanta was born 1874, Carl Jung was born 1875. So you can, from both sides, and, and you can look at either culture and by, by Building the bridge between those two two cultures, they so they grew up. One grew up exactly in India, came right up to Prabhupada. Another one grew up exactly in, in the West. You know, so it forms a tremendous ability to bridge our two cultures. You know, yeah. Jung, 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 and then again Jung into the modern world. Yeah. So we're going to change the world here. We're going to get rid of all these archetypes. We're going to we're going to purify Putin, Putin of his archetypes. We're going to purify Donald Trump of his archetypes. <laughs> That's the Pope, they'll all be chanting and dancing ecstasy at the, at the feet of the Virgin Mary. <laughs> at the feet of Virgin Mary, okay. She's, she's an incarnation of Radha or Durga. I'm, not sure. <laughs> I'm just amazed at how many cross cultural correlations you are able to just spring off the top of your head so quickly. <laughs> Yeah. When you're when you're 72 years old, you'll be a lot more a lot more. Uh, what, what is the word? Crazy than I am. There you go. Yeah. 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 I hope I can be half like my, like last time I mentioned. I hope I can be half as alert as you are at that age. 
<laughs> Should I try to summarize Maharaj? It was very diverse. I'm not sure whether I can, but at least I'll make an attempt. So today, we did discuss primarily, you could say that Carl Jung and as a psychology, as a, as a psychological research resource for understanding and practicing bhakti, you could say, for practicing and sharing bhakti. So and broadly, that was the theme. And then we started talking about a historical context. So you said that Carl Jung can, because we are all born and brought up in the post, in the in the in the legacy of the industrialized world. So the way Carl Jung analyzed the human mind and human society that can help us to understand our own inheritance, inheritance, or our what has formed us at the psych, psychic level. And you talked about uh, the reading list of books which can which. Through even Indian think Indian intellectuals are also studying Carl Jung and how <clears throat> broadly speaking, when you talk about Jung, the whole idea was that he came at a time when there was a lot of disaffection with uh, institutionalized religion, even with the institutionalized conception of God. But at the same time, there is there was inquiry. There was inquiry into the nature of the world, nature nature of the especially nature of the mind, and then uh, we discussed some parallels between say. How Freud and uh, Jung worked together, and eventually, it is not that Jung became uh, antagonistic to Freud. Rather, Freud he felt that he was limited by his obsession with sex, and then he went on his own way. Um, and we also discussed some quotes about how he was appreciative about the value of religion, and he did say that there is there is some higher reality. Even if he didn't talk specifically talk about a personal God, he talk about some some higher reality. So then we discussed some parallels between. um aristotle uh, young and freud and similarly aristotle and plato and then you mentioned this whole let us a new dimension for me at alchemy and mechanical science mechanical physics or mechanical mechanical they were called the mechanical philosophers mechanical philosophers yeah so alchemy is not just about transforming let's say iron into gold it is about basically refining and purifying so not just external elements but also the inner elements and the idea that everything has meaning which was lost so you said that how thomas aquinas aquinas was the person who tried to analyze everything and his philosophy was his way of analyzing was standardized by the church but was it bonaventure who said that was wanted to bon, he said the other thinker bon, bon who bon, said that bonaventura good bon fortune aventura. okay bonaventura saint, yeah saint, saint bonaventura they, they took their phd's at the same moment From the University of Paris. Oh, okay. Same okay. moment. Bonaventura was synthetic, and Aristotle was, was analytic. Yeah. So he said that. So Carl Jung was both analytic, but also to an extent synthetic in the sense that he was not just studying people who were sick, but also that he he was in India, went to Africa, deep into the African culture, and then interacted with <laughs> thinkers um, like William James and others in America also. So broadly, so he was more looking at life as it was lived. Not normally, not just at sick people, but also at healthy people, and trying to understand uh, how things work. And then we talked about the correlation with respect to the Vedas. That was the second point: is that multiple ways. One is that you could say that his conception of the ultimate reality was something like the above the Virat Rupa at the Hiranya, around the Hiranya Garbha level, and his consciousness in terms of self understanding was. at the level of ether or space like we go through annamaya pranamaya those levels of consciousness so going deeper into toward uh, toward deeper level of self understanding and then as far as as how is it relevant today you talked about your experience in going to the conference in california where there are a lot of young people and a lot of thoughtful people it was there so he is a very vibrant uh, vibrant influence even in today's world and then you talked about especially i think uh, was it was elaborate but very relevant section was how as devotees can also be helped but in reading him can be therapeutically valuable for devotees so you talked about how several influential devotees and a wide range of devotees have had problems and sometimes some problems require psychiatric intervention some medication but also uh, you talked about that exercise where in there was a trauma in childhood and is taking different roles and understanding how that trauma can be dealt with so that helps prevent sometimes otherwise we overreact to certain issues because they are they have triggered some festering wounds from our past 
and then lastly i think the more i think the most uh, one of the most insightful parts of it was the idea of archetypes so the archetypes are are we could say they're not just like uh, psychological constructs but rather they are you could say almost like universal 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 truths i don't know what like a part of the virat rupa they are un- they are you could say conceptualizations or embodiments of universal roles and realities that uh, when we try to when we function in the world we all embody those to par- to to different degrees mm-hmm. and understanding them can help us perform our particular roles properly and you talk about how varanashram at one level is meant to elevate but varanashram can also become the highest trap so and then talk about karma mishra and gyana mishra so ultimately we want to go towards shuddha bhakti but for some people the doors will open if they are from the karma background then karma mishra bhakti is what opens the doors for them and for people who are from the gyana background then gyana mishra bhakti which involves a lot of intellection and analysis and self reflection that is the way the doors to bhakti can open for them and then i think the concluding point which mentioned was that when we are ourselves practicing or sharing bhakti this um, the more we understand ourselves like george chaitanya mahaprabhu is sanatan shiksha he is telling that he is ultimately giving us ecstasy dancing in ecstasy like lord chaitanya did but to go toward that you know, lord chaitanya mahaprabhu's mercy can be manifested in many different ways and that mercy can touch us and we can go touch others also through us so it is quite so you talk about trump and putin all of them be also archetype that can be purified that's a very kind of expansive vision so remarkable thank you very much for sharing this uh, it is a i would say it is a uh, roller coaster intellectual journey <laughs> <laughs> intellectual roller coaster <laughs> and that, and now we can get off and let's not get let's not get back on again today this is the natural coaster is what thank right. you very much Sure. And also thank you to the devotees who came or are listening. Is Ishwari Ishwari Rade, Shunivas, and Gopi Sundarika. Thank them also for being in our audience there. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much for joining. I yeah, think yeah. Shri Mas Acharya yeah. shared something about the human matrix personality. Yeah. Is this something which you have prepared, Maharaj? Or no, no, no. I didn't. I didn't notice what he gave like that. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Okay, I'll have a look at that. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Humble obeisance. Thank you all very much. Hari Krishna, all glory to Shri Prabhupada. Jai Shri Prabhupada. Thank you.